One does not simply wake up and have the ability to climb a mountain like K2. With the summit to death ratio of 4 to 1, it takes years and years of true mountaineering mastery to even consider a climb of the Savage Mountain. Hours of studying the best techniques, forcing your body to become acclimated with the brutal conditions, and a never give up attitude. Only a select few would be considered in this category, and Steve Unch was one of those few. Known for being an explorer that could put people at ease with his smile or loud laugh, Steve truly cared about every life. In 1994, Steve along with three other climbers would all travel to K2 in an attempt to summit, an expedition that would test Steve's character and forever alter his destiny. This is his story. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel where we cover all tragic and terror stories. So if you enjoy this type of content, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, plus ring the notification bell to be notified of all new uploads. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. The year of 1994 was an exciting time for K2. There were many ongoing expeditions with multiple occurring at the same time. So when Steve, fellow American David Bridges, Australian Michael Groom, and Welshman Harry Taylor arrived at base camp, it was busy to say the least. It was early July, which was right in the time frame of the most attempts as the winter months can bring in possible conditions. Steve and his team were very social and they quickly made friends around camp. If you were lucky to be sitting next to the campfire, Steve would recall one of his adventure stories that could entertain anyone. Perhaps he would talk about his time climbing in Peru, Ecuador, the Himalayas. Maybe you would hear about his many cave exploring stories where he helped conduct scientific research in New Mexico. But if you were really lucky, Steve would talk about the time where he would hand deliver groceries for his neighborhood on cross country skis, all with a large smile on his face and an occasional chuckle. There was a persona that radiated from Steve, one that others just wanted to be around. The start of their climb is not covered, so I'm only able to fill in bits and pieces from other expedition testimonials, but from what I can tell, the force struggled when they began their summit attempts. Their documented plan was to take the northwest face route, but once they were on the mountain, that plan changed, and the team shifted to attempt to summit by the Cesian route. According to multiple other expeditions, delays in early July were consistent with every team. There had been heavy snowfall at the start of the month, which caused camps to get buried, routes to be under feet of snow, and exhaustion levels to be raised. Not much more would be known until July 17th, where the team was at Camp 2. Now, they were not the only team at camp, as another international squad of five climbers named the Amicable Alpine Expedition had spent the previous night there. They consisted of climbers New Zealander Rob Hall, Finn Veka Gustafsson, Germans Axel Schlonvat, Mickey Worthel, and their leader Ralph Dujmovitz. But that morning, the weather again had taken a turn for the worse, as snow continued to fall and visibility was poor. Everyone was exhausted. Steve and company decided to not climb higher for the day and to rest, which was against the desire of Michael as he wanted to continue the climb. So when the amicable alpine climbers told Steve that they would be continuing their climb that day, a brief discussion was held and Michael Groom would join them as they set out for Camp 3. Steve, David, and Harry had planned to eventually meet back up with Michael a few days later. Michael and his new teammates managed to make it to Camp 3 without incident, but because of the snowfall, they had to dig under 2 meters of snow to reach the tent and supplies, which took Michael, Ralph, and the others over 3 grueling hours. Of course, that did not stop them. And the next day, Michael and his newly found team managed to climb to Camp 4 at 7,850 meters. But before they rested for the night, over 50 bamboo wands were placed around camp to mark their location. Thankfully, they set up their markers as a heavy snowfall fell again that night and would not lighten up the following day. Due to bad conditions, Michael, Ralph, and the remaining climbers would be stuck at Camp 4 for five days. Finally, on July 23rd, a full moon lit up the night sky, which revealed clear skies. Ralph, Michael, and the others would take advantage of the reprieve and bad weather, and it was slightly past midnight when the group of climbers packed up their gear and began their climb. They wanted to start early for a summit attempt, as they had a lot of ground to make up, and it was also expected for the terrain to be more unforgiving than usual, as constant snow had been building up for the past month. They climbed for hours, and by 5 a.m. had made it to the infamous K2 bottleneck. A scary thought as a high wall of snow and ice towers over you. If one piece falls, you will go down with it. 
Despite the thought, they pushed forward as this meant that they were getting closer to the summit. But as the team was making their way through the bottleneck, they had to pass by two Ukrainian bodies hanging by rope above them. Understandably, this dampened the mood and the team paused for a moment to consider climbing further. But they were so close and the thought of stopping was quickly dismissed. Nevertheless, the bodies reminded each individual just how dangerous K2 can be. By 11 a.m., Michael, Ralph, and his team had all made the summit. The images of the bodies in their heads were quickly forgotten as the excitement of accomplishing something so challenging was overwhelming. Each climber began using their radios to let the others know. Michael would call out for his friends over the radio, but the service was spotty and he would not receive a response. After a few minutes had passed and the emotions began to calm, Ralph began instructing everyone to prepare for the descent. Clouds had started to develop in the sky, and given the weather for the past few weeks, they did not want to be stuck on the summit, as this would certainly mean death for them all. They descended fast, using precious energy. The clouds had brought more bad weather with them, and by the time the team had made it back to the Ukrainian bodies, they could not see due to the heavy snow. The team relied on a fixed rope leading them down the bottleneck, one foot after the other, praying that the large chunks of snow hanging above you don't fall. Ralph was leading and would stumble upon a third Ukrainian body along the rope, and it was too much. Ralph was sick to his stomach. They couldn't see, they were exhausted, but they managed to make it to the shoulder of the bottleneck where they set up camp. The next day, the weather would lighten a bit, although the snow would continue to fall. This was just enough for Ralph to spot the bamboo sticks that they had erected on the way up, just about 50 meters away from where they had set up camp. A marker that may have just saved all of their lives. And within minutes, the team was packed and heading down the mountain. One by one, they followed each other in the snow, all attached by the same rope. By the time they had reached Camp 3, the weather had not improved. Visibility remained poor and the temperatures kept dropping. Each climber had to be more cognizant of their gear as the harsh exposures to the temperatures can cause malfunctions. Specifically, the fixed lines were unstable as by now they had all been iced over and the ropes were brittle. Michael and the others spent hours in unimaginable conditions before finally they were in reach of Camp 2. Just before arriving at camp, Michael took a wrong step on the ice and twisted his knee. The injury did not seem severe, although the knee was tender to the touch. Michael and Schlonvat were exhausted and could not go any further, so they planned to stay for the night. Ralph, on the other hand, had desperately wanted to get off the mountain, and after a discussion, Ralph, Worthel, and Gustafsson left Camp 2 with the goal of making it to base camp. Ralph and team would make it safely back, where they were greeted by Steve, David, and Harry. They were happy to see each other and even congratulated them on their summit attempt, but Michael was still up there. And being the person that Steve was, he could not relax until his friend was safe. The next morning, Michael woke up to a lot of pain. He would try to fight through it and take a step on his leg, but his weight would not hold. It was hard not to feel a little hopeless, a feeling that would be any climber's worst nightmare. But luckily for Michael, Steve would not abandon his friend on the mountain. The plan was for Steve and David to go together, and they were bringing Michael pain medication in hopes that it would provide some reprieve for him. Realistically, they expected to have to carry Michael most of the way, and it had to be done quickly as they were not prepared to spend the night on the mountain, nor did they want to. The climbers at base camp watched from below as Steve and David slowly made progress up the mountain. All of camp was rooting for them. They honestly had high hopes that everything would be fine. The temperatures were still extremely cold, but at least the snow had stopped falling, and they would make it to Camp 2 safely where they were greeted by Michael and Schlonvat. Steve gave Michael the medicine, and as they waited for it to take effect, they began gathering their gear. Steve was the biggest guy out of all of them, and therefore was designated to carry Michael's pack, and Steve was eager to help and wanted to carry most of the weight himself. So being the caring person he is, he did not complain at all. After a few minutes, they were ready to start their descent. Michael had to be helped almost every step of the way, and because of the weather had improved slightly from the previous week, there were expeditions climbing up the mountain. They would occasionally pass by a team on their descent. When they arrived at House Chimney, an almost vertical climb that finishes by scaling in between two large hanging rocks, a Korean expedition was climbing up it. Poor timing for Steve and his friends, as they did not want to wait. The fixed ropes that had been tested and known to be stable were in use. Steve tied a piece of rope around himself and Michael, and after making sure it was secure, Michael was lowered past the house chimney. At this point, Steve and his team have had a long day, and they desperately desired to get off the mountain and to get Michael medical attention, but they had to wait, or did they? 
As a Korean climber was ascending up the house chimney, Steve spotted some old ropes that were still hanging from the rocks, and for some reason when Steve spotted these ropes, he began to attach himself in preparation to descend. It is not known if he was warned, but Steve did not want to wait, and after sliding over the rock ledge, he began to descend on the old rope. One could hear the tug of the rope tighten under his weight, and then all of a sudden, a snap was heard. And Steve plummeted 800 meters to the ground. It was impossible for him to survive the fall, and everyone looked on in disbelief. It was almost hard to accept what had just happened. One moment Steve was there, and the next the rope snapped. I can't tell you exactly how Michael felt, or how the Koreans felt, or even David, but I can tell you Steve was loved, and his death impacted everyone there. The only reason he was even on the mountain at the time was to help somebody else, and I believe Steve embodied what we as humans all strive to be, a person that genuinely brings joy to others. Michael and everyone involved would make it back to base camp safely, where they delivered the news. It was a sad day for everyone, and there would not be another successful summit for the season. The rope Steve had attached himself to had been exposed to the harsh conditions for the month of July. By the time Steve had put his weight on the rope, it was frozen and snapped with the pressure. He embodied what it truly meant to be an adventurer and someone that is not afraid of the unknown. But it is hard not to think that if he had just been patient, would Steve still be alive today?